good to uh, be with you guys again today. And uh, it's kind of exciting because the, the last webinar we did, uh, this topic actually came up, and I believe it was because of a request from one of the uh, one of the attendees last time that we actually decided to do this webinar as well. Uh, so very excited about this. Um, you know, EPUB three is a, a really interesting and and uh, powerful tool uh, if used in the right way and if supported by the systems the way you want it to be. So uh, I want to start off before we get too deep. Let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is Joshua Talent. I'm Chief Ebook Architect at, at uh, Firebrand Technologies. I've been doing ebook development for more than a decade, um, and you know I've uh, I've really got a lot of experience dealing with these kinds of questions, the technical issues, and how do you build ebooks, and uh, what kind of workflows do you do? Uh, but what I try to do in, in every way I can, whenever I'm talking to people and giving advice or or teaching, is is to go through things from a practical perspective. So you'll get a lot of practicality uh, from today's session, and hopefully, if you're you're going to probably need to be a little bit into the coding side to really make sense of some of this. But hopefully, um, if you if you don't catch it, you'll be able to go back later to the recording or to the uh, to the slide deck and and understand a little bit better. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about um, EPUB three and how things how things work. Now, EPUB three is pretty cool. It's a it's a really good uh, format. Uh, for those who may not know what EPUB three really is, it's just the latest version of the open source EPUB standard for ebook development, ebook uh, ebook formats. Um, it is an awesome format. It is also a very frustrating format. Uh, the problem is that as we're moving into support for EPUB three in the marketplace, as more devices get support, more reading systems get support. Um, there's a lot of limitations about where EPUB3 files will work and where they won't work, what features will work and which ones won't work. Um, so as we're moving this direction, the first thing you have to think about is, okay, I'm making EPUB2 files already. What's different? What's new in EPUB3 uh, that's going to make the difference in, in what I decide to do and how quickly I decide to move to the EPUB3 standard? Um, so if you've uh, if you've seen any any webinar or teaching I've done in the last year, you've probably seen this this slide right here. Um, these are this is a list of a, a lot of the new things that are available and uh, built into the EPUB three standard. Um, XHTML five, which is just the latest you know most up to date version of HTML. Um, the spine, you know, the structure of your book can actually have SGB, uh, SVG images uh, as as part of the. Uh, part of the structural elements, or even the whole structural elements, you don't even don't even have to use HTML in your book if you don't want to. You could use just SVG, although there's uh, questions and issues about how that might work. Um, video and audio support is one that a lot of people are really excited about: the ability to add media into your con into your content. Um, EPUB three audio overlays, which is uh, the read to me kind of features that you see in children's books on the iPad and iBooks, uh, that's coming in as part of the the whole EPUB spec. Um, and it's uh, it's going to be available. It's available for any kind of book, not just children's books. Uh, JavaScript support, uh, enhanced language uh, support for especially vertical writing and right to left writing directions and other things that are not really supported in EPUB 2. Uh, MathML support, which is really exciting for textbook authors and people who have lots of math in their in their content. Uh, CSS media queries that allow you to adjust and, and adapt your contents layout depending on the screen size or the like, orientation, those kinds of things. Uh, CSS3 styling uh, with EPUB specific prefixes, so things that you can do in EPUB only that are not really built into CSS but are, but are more uh, specific to how book content or book type content might need to be displayed. So these are all things that are uh, part of the EPUB spec. Uh, and are supposed to be usable for uh, in EPUB 3 uh, for pretty much any book. Now the, the question is how much of these things will be supported in the real world on the actual devices? Um, and in, in some cases it's going to be the, the support for these things is going to be very minimal. Um, so the things you see crossed out in red on your screen are things that are uh, part of the spec, and they are ostensibly required by the spec, but at the same time that if the reading system can't handle them uh, or if there's you know, some reason not to support them, they don't have to be supported. Uh, video and audio support, you know, if, if you have a, an older device that does support EPUB 3 in some way, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to support audio or video. Um, 
the the spec is is kind of unclear about the audio thing, but I, as far as I can tell, the you know, video and audio are not required uh, in order for the for the device to be a uh, an EPUB three compliant reading system. Um, audio overlays, JavaScript. JavaScript is kind of questionable in a lot of cases, just because people are really concerned about security flaws. Although you know, I should note that. You know, when you're doing development in JavaScript, it is possible to, to keep a lot of that stuff from being too much of a problem. So hopefully we'll see good JavaScript support across the board. Global language support is going to be, it's required as part of the spec, but there are some aspects of it like Ruby, uh, which is useful for uh, Japanese and Chinese that, that may not necessarily be supported across the board on every device, um, especially the more complex types of global language uh, support you might need. MathML, there is a, there is a, a good chunk of MathML that is Required, but it's not complete. Uh, so, you know, if you if you do extremely complex math stuff or some things that are kind of outside the normal path, uh, you might have some difficulty on some devices, depending on how the MathML is being supported and what what tools are being used to display the MathML. Uh, CSS media queries are not required by the spec uh, by reading system, and then uh, CSS3 media, uh, CSS3 styling with EPUB specific prefixes are also not. So these are things that may or may not be supported. Now, if you if you look at um, how EPUB 3 is going to be implemented across a, a lot of the different devices and reading systems that are out there. Um, I think in, in most cases we'll see video and audio support on, on most devices. We'll see audio overlays on most devices. Uh, JavaScript will probably be in, uh, in place at least in some way on, on most devices. Uh, you know, and probably some level of CSS media queries and styling. The question is always going to be how much and how different will those different reading systems be? There's no telling really until we get into this um, as we as we move down the path of, of seeing support for EPUB 3. There's really not a whole lot of information yet on how much of this will be visible to us and how much will be usable uh, on as many devices as we'd like. So let's look a little bit about EPUB 3 in the real world and if you missed our uh, our last webinar back in June. This was uh, this was a, a core part of what we talked about in EPUB three. Uh, is really where where do things stand right now? So I won't go too deep into this. Just kind of a quick overview. Um, Apple has the best support for EPUB three. You can do reflowable and fixed layout EPUB three files uh, in the Apple iBooks platform. Uh, be careful about your footnotes. We'll talk more about that later. But in in, re, in in the real world, Apple really has the best support for EPUB 3. So if, you, if you're going to build EPUB 3 files now, in most cases, you're probably building it for Apple. Uh, Barnes & Noble doesn't have any official support for EPUB 3, but if you build a backwards compatible reflowable EPUB 3 file um, uh, that is backwards compatible to EPUB 2, then it won't be rejected from their system. So at least you can, you know, if you're doing a single, a single file workflow and developing EPUB 3, uh, you can at least give the file to Barnes & Noble. Um, Kobo has uh, some level support for reflowable EPUB3 files across their platform. Uh, fixed layout is uh, support is very new and uh, it is kind of present. But if you want to talk, if you want to put a fixed layout EPUB3 file up into their system, you really need to talk to their technical support people and and make sure that you're you're dealing with them directly because it's it's so new. I don't think they actually are are just accepting them out of, uh, outright. Um, also, there are some issues with how EPUB3 files are imported into their system, so you have to be careful about uh, naming of files and how their import process handles EPUBs in general. So some things will probably get thrown off a little bit. Uh, so do a lot of testing uh, post-import and make sure that the file came out looking the way it's supposed to. Google has support for children's fixed layout EPUB3 files, uh, but not with enhancements. Um, they don't support reflowable EPUB3 yet. Um, Sony is uh, does have some support in their Android app for reflowable and fixed layout EPUB3, not on the Sony device, the the T2 or even the T1 or these other these other dedicated devices, and not in their iOS app either. Uh, backwards compatible reflow files will work on those other devices, though. So again, if you if you're going to a single source approach, a single files uh, approach, and you want to get all of the you know get your EPUB3 file out into all the major markets, um, then you can do that, but just make sure it's backwards compatible, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, I, I'll note that I didn't specif specify you know, Kindle at all in this list because Kindle does not accept EPUB files. Uh, they will take an EPUB file and convert it into Kindle, into the KFA format, but they do not, Amazon does not have EPUB 3 support. So anything that you do in EPUB 3 or even anything you do in EPUB 2, uh, I highly recommend that you do the conversion yourself uh, into KFA 
just if, if necessary, just run your EPUB file through the Kindle Gen tool um, and then test the output and make sure that it works the way you expect it to. Remember that KF8 and EPUB 3 are different specifications. So things that you're doing in EPUB 3 that you think should work fine in the Kindle, um, you, you want to double check and make sure that it actually does because in some cases it may or in some cases it may not. And it may not work exactly the way you want it to either. So it's very, be very cautious about the use of uh, of an EPUB file. Don't, don't ever just give your EPUB file to Amazon. I never recommend doing that. Uh, if you want to know where support is right now for EPUB 3 across different devices, actually specific devices within, within each family uh, of, of devices, I would recommend that you look at the BISG EPUB 3 support grid. Uh, you can download that at tinyurl.com slash BISG EPUB 3. Um, the, this is a really good source of information. It's updated uh, every six months or so, it seems like, and, and so it's, it, it's kept up to date a little bit. Uh, there's some work on uh, making making this support grid a much more uh, much more up to date on a more regular basis and, and doing it in a different way. So uh, be on the lookout for how BISG is going to be implementing this in the future with some help from IDPF. Um, highly recommend that you take a look at this though, because if you're looking for information, this is this is a pretty good resource for how to you know how to make sure you're you're going to be making EPUB three files to work on the devices you're targeting. So the real question you need to ask before you go to EPUB three is what is your goal? Uh, most publishers who are providing EPUB three files uh, to the retailers are really just changing the container. They're not really doing a lot to make the EPUB three files something that is really complex or has lots of features. Um, that is happening, but not nearly on the level that you might expect. Uh, because of this lack of support or the varying levels of support across the different devices, uh, a lot of retailers that move to EPUB 3 really don't have a lot of in-house staff for doing specialty work on every single book they're creating. So they, they may be providing EPUB 3 for every book to all the retailers, but really what they're doing is, you know, for the most part, taking an EPUB 2 file and converting it. Um, or, or going through a process to have a, a very basic EPUB 3 file. So it's more about the container of the EPUB file being EPUB 3 compliant than really the whole book being, you know, having JavaScript everywhere and MathML everywhere and all this other stuff. Um, the more of that extra functionality you add right now in the marketplace, the, the less you're going to have support across devices. And you, have to, you just have to be careful about you know, testing it everywhere and make sure you target those devices that have uh, the support that you're looking for for those features. So if you're dealing with the question of what is your goal, do you have actual formatting or functionality requirements? When you're going to EPUB 3, if you don't have requirements in the project that you're working on that you have to have you know, some sort of extra feature, let's say MathML, if you don't have MathML or something like that, then is there really a need to go to EPUB 3 yet? Well, maybe not. Uh, so always ask yourself that question, is, is there a benefit, is there a need for us to go to EPUB 3 because of some sort of functionality or formatting? Do we need accessibility? Are you targeting uh, students or some, some other uh, specific marketplace that really requires you to have better accessibility in your content? Uh, maybe I mean, if, you're, if you're writing a book about, uh, you know, about people who have uh, visual impairments or something, then that might actually be beneficial to go into EPUB 3, add a lot of accessibility capabilities into it, make sure that it's been tested on screen reading, screen reading systems so that it's, uh, it's going to cover more of your bases um, on that. And that might be a, a, a good reason for going there. Do you just want the eye candy? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's a really important question. Is, is this more of a, you know, my boss told me he wanted me to have a, have some sort of XYZ feature, and it really is just making the book look prettier. Um, if that's the case, then you may want to, you know, judge the business case on that and try to figure out whether that's going to be helpful to you in the end. Uh, again, because of lack of support, you may be limiting where you can sell your book if you're trying to add just, you know, special eye candy, whether that's extra, you know, videos and uh, audio files or whether that's, uh, you know, just trying to take advantage of some CSS3 goodies or something. It may be that you're better off skipping EPUB 3 and staying with EPUB 2 and Kindle so that you can more broadly address uh, market forces and being able to sell your book in every, in every uh, reading system. Uh, so think about the business case. I really encourage you when you're dealing with the question of, of going to EPUB 3, don't just do it. Don't just jump into it yet. We're not quite to the point where we have the support. Now, early next year, we'll probably have many more devices, especially because of the Redium Foundation and the work it's doing on the, on the Redium SDK to develop a standardized system for uh, displaying EPUB, EPUB 3 files. Uh, with that work, you know, 
completing its work hopefully in the end of the year first of the next year, uh, by early spring or late spring, we'll probably start seeing more devices with EPUB3 support. And at that point, it may, might make more sense to, to start really uh, rehashing these questions on a broader level for more of your books, uh, for more of your content. So let's go on and talk about the basic process. Now, I, I'm going to talk about the basics first because you know these are things you can do right now to just basically to create a uh, an EPUB3 file from your EPUB2. So the, my assumption is that you have an EPUB2 file. You've already done the development work on that. Whether you're going from InDesign or you're coming from a, you know a, a, some other process you've created or whatever, but you've got an EPUB2 file. Uh, we'll assume also for the for the beginning of this that your EPUB2 file validates that you've tested it against EPUB check, uh, so you know that it actually is a valid EPUB2 file. Um, and these are steps that you can take. These basic steps to convert that EPUB2 file into an EPUB3. And once we get past the basic steps, now these basic steps are basically the container, right? This is what I talked about earlier with a lot of publishers are just doing the container changes. Um, this, these, these steps we're about to cover are about that. And then in a little while later, we'll talk about some best practices that you can use to, to go further than just those basic container changes. So first and foremost, let's go with, let's talk about the HTML5 headers. Uh, changing your, the headers in all of your XHTML file, uh, files into HTML5 headers is not really that hard, and it can be automated. So if you're able to write some Perl scripts or, uh, or something like that, then you may want to try to automate this. You could even open up all the files in your text editor if you're using you know, Oxygen or Sublime Text or one of these, uh, these good HTML editors, which you should be using. Um, then you can, you can do a, a find and replace on all of your documents and change this pretty quickly. Um, so let's look first at an XHTML 1.1 header. This is a typical header at the top of every HTML file that you would see in a, in a current EPUB2 document. Uh, you've got the XML version number at the top, which is not actually necessarily required, but it is there. Um, the doc type, which is uh, in this case pointing to the XHTML 1.1 DTD. Um, you have an HTML tag uh, that includes a namespace pointing to uh, HTML, uh, XHTML 1.1. Um, the head tag, the title of the book, uh, the meta tag that points out that this is a character set UTF-8, which uh, is telling it what, what character set uh, the content uh, covers, um, Unicode. And then the link to the style sheet, which in this case is just a pretty straightforward link, and then the closing of the head and the opening of the body tag. Now this header is pretty standardized. Um, it may be a little different in yours, so you'll want to you know, make sure that you're, you're, uh, when you're doing your find and replace, you're checking for that. Uh, but this is a pretty standard XHTML 1.1 header. Uh, now the HTML5 header is actually more simple. Uh, for one thing, the doc type is completely gone at this point. I mean, the, there's no XML statement. You don't have to have that XML statement at all in HTML5. Um, the doc type is uh, reduced down to just say this is an HTML file. There's no more of this, so we're pointing to a DTD or you know we have to be a specific version of HTML. It's just HTML. Um, the namespace is that you have in your uh, HTML document though, and your HTML tag are a little bit different. You do have the namespace pointing to the XHTML um, uh, XHTML namespace, which tells this document this is an XML version of HTML. Right, so you're making sure that you're having the rules of XML implied. Uh, in, imposed on this document, and then you also you want to have the EPUB namespace as well, which you, you see the uh, XML NS uh, colon EPUB. This is pointing to the EPUB uh, namespace that you'll want to have in your document. Um, the head is a uh, you know, header header title that are both the same pretty much. Uh, the meta character set is this this is a much smaller meta tag than the earlier UTF-8 meta tag. Um, it, it's just saying hey the character set for this document is UTF-8. And the style sheet link is also uh, shorter as well. Uh, so this is a pretty straightforward HTML5 header. You can see that you can find this online pretty quickly as well. Uh, the only thing that would be different for the EPUB really is just the, the namespace for EPUB. So let's talk about the next step here, which is navigation um, and dealing with the navigation HTML document. This, this is one of the bigger changes that you have to make in going from EPUB2 to EPUB3. This file is a replacement not only for the NCX file, uh, which is that structural table of contents that's in EPUB2, but also for the visible table of contents HTML file that most books contain as well. So you do have to have a document in in every ebook you create uh, that is this this visible table of contents file. Um, 
you know, the content on it doesn't necessarily have to be visible, but the but the contents do. The table of contents needs to be there. Uh, it also integrates the guide section from the OPF, um, and and uh, if you have a page list from your uh, table, your NCX file, that goes in here as well. Uh, it uses the HTML5 nav tag, uh, which is built into HTML5. As uh, if you think from a website perspective, it'd be where the menu, how the menu is marked up on a web page. Um, so and this is uh, really navigation for the content of the of the of the book, uh, and then you have ordered lists underneath this nav tag that that are basically the structure of the document in an ordered list. Ordered list being one, two, three, four, A, B, C, that kind of thing. Um, there's no requirement that you display that content, uh, the ordered list itself, and we'll talk about that. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, but the ordered list gives the structure, and ordered lists are a little bit easier to to do. Uh, than, than trying to do the old NCX formatting, which is a little more complex than just a straight ordered list. Um, it can be formatted with CSS, so if you want to, you can display the, the ordered list in a, in a way that makes sense to you and your content, or you can hide it to allow a visible table of contents that looks better or is more cross-platform. So if you're, if you're having trouble getting your CSS to, you know, to work across all the different devices and maybe you, wanna, you don't want the ordered list to show up as an ordered list, you want to get rid of the numbers and make it look like paragraphs, uh, you can you can do that um, in CSS, but if it's not being supported on the devices that you're trying to target, then you might want to change that. Uh, the hidden attribute is used to make that invisible, to make this content invisible. So let's look at a uh, an example of this. Here's a, a very basic table of contents. I want to point out a couple of pieces here that are kind of important. Uh, first is at the top in the nav tag, you have EPUB type talk. Uh, this is pointing out that the navigation here, the navigation section that you're looking at in, in this nav tag is specifically a table of contents. Uh, and we'll see in a minute when we do page list that there's a different EPUB type for that. And we'll talk later about EPUB types in general as well. So EPUB type talk. Uh, underneath that, you'll see there's a header. Now, this header, I'm using H1s. Uh, you can use any of the H1 through 6 tags that you want, uh, whatever, de depending on the structure of your document. Um, but this is a header that's also optional. So if you want to say this is a table of contents or this is a or this is contents or this is list of figures or this is whatever, right? Whatever you have, this is uh, whatever kind of table of contents this is, um, you you want to make sure that that's visible here and you know have some sort of header. And then you'll notice the beginning of the uh, of the OL tags, um, your list your list is pretty straightforward nested lists uh, like you would normally do. In this first list item, you'll notice that the span tags have highlighted them in red. Every single list item has to either have an, an anchor tag, an A tag, wrapping around the content, or it has to have a span tag wrapped around the content. Uh, the span tag in this case doesn't have a class or any of the kind of uh, specific uh, content. It's really just saying, hey, this is something that is being used as, as part of the structure of the book, but it's not pointing to a specific location. Uh, which in the case of maybe you know chapter one, it might not make a lot of sense to have a span tag, uh, but for the case of example, that's why I, I just put it there as a span instead of an anchor. Um, you know, another example you might have here is if this was a list of illustrations, you might say you know chapter one has uh, three or four illustrations in it, so chapter one is just kind of structurally you're breaking down your list of illustrations by chapter. You're not going to point to chapter one. You're going to point to each individual illustration uh, within chapter one. So that's uh, the basic structure of the navigation uh, section for a table of contents. If you have pages from your print book that you're linking within your, your ebook, and you have you have anchor tags or span tags or something uh, in your document that are they're marking the locations of where your print pages were. Uh, just like you have an NCX file, uh, you have a page list in, in this nav section as well. So the EPUB type is page dash list. And in this case, I'm hiding the contents of this visually so that the reader doesn't see it. I don't really want the reader to just see a list of numbers that are all links to 400 pages in the document. But I do want them to be available for the reading system should the reading system decide to offer some kind of navigation based on the page list. Um, again, there's a, a header if you want to you know, name what, this, what kind of uh, navigation this is, and then you'll see each individual item. Uh, again, it's either uh, anchor tags linking to specific locations, or if you wanted to break it up somehow, uh, book one, book two, or something like that, you could do that with some structure in your in your list as well. The landmarks EPUB type uh, navigation. This this is the replacement for the guide. 
which if you're not familiar with the guide is a section in EPUB 2 that's in the OPF file. It's not in the NCX of EPUB 2. It's actually in the bottom of the OPF file uh, that would point to the table of contents, the first reading location, a list of illustrations, other special locations within the document. It's almost like a it's almost like a table of contents, but it's more high level than that. It's it's almost a um, pointing out you know special locations within the book. Uh, this is what's used by Amazon to do its, uh, you know, turning on its link to the table, you know, go to table of contents or go to beginning. That's how that's done in this, um, in the EPUB 3. It would be done this way and EPUB 2 would be part of the guide. Uh, again, there's a different EPUB type landmarks and then there's, uh, you're using EPUB type attributes as well to point out, okay, this is, uh, this anchor is pointed to the table of contents or it's pointed to a list of illustrations or it's pointed to the body matter. Uh, and again, we'll come back to EPUB type later and I'll explain uh, what that is and how that works. All right, so now that you've got your HTML navigation document built, which you could just replace your older HTML, your older HTML talk with that, um, you, you can create that, you know, put that HTML file together. You don't have to have the NCX, but if you want to, you can keep your original NCX uh, in order to maintain uh, backwards compatibility with EPUB 2. Uh, there's no difficulty in, in, do, in doing that, and it would actually be recommended right now, especially since most devices don't support EPUB 3 uh, completely. Uh, so keep your NCX file there, but make sure your HTML uh, file that's got your table of contents is set up with these nav systems. Uh, the version number needs to change in your OPF. Uh, the OPF file uh, at the very top, the package element in the OPF is going to say version equals 3.0. Um, and that obviously would change later as you're supporting later versions of, of the EPUB spec. Um, you want to also remove the OPF scheme from the DC identifier in your metadata. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't even have one, so this may not even be specifically something you have in your EPUB 2 files, but if you, if you have an OPF scheme, you want to you remove that attribute and the value from that. Uh, if you want to specify what kind of identifier you're, you're pushing, you're pointing to, you can use the appropriate meta tag that's built into the EPUB spec, and I'd recommend you look at the EPUB spec um, itself for more information about using meta tags to, to drill down and give more information about different uh, metadata elements within your, within your OPF file. You do want to mark the navdoc uh, manifest item, so you just built this HTML file, it's got your navigation in it. Uh, go into the manifest and find the, the item uh, that is uh, for, that's pointing to that XHTML file, and make sure you put the properties equals nav uh, attribute and value there inside that item tag. Uh, and that tells all the reading systems uh, which one of the files in this EPUB document is um, is the one to go to for the table of contents. You also want to do the same thing for your cover image. The actual JPEG that you're using for your cover, um, this, is, uh, this is how you mark that and specify that it is the cover image. Um, and I would recommend as well that you go ahead and leave the meta tag. Most EPUB2 documents have a, uh, a meta tag in the, in the manifest, or sorry, in the, in the metadata section that says, you know, points to that cover HTML as well, or cover image as well. Uh, go ahead and leave that in as well for backwards compatibility sake with your with your EPUB2 uh, reading systems. All right, so that's the that's the basics. Your your basic process is fixing your XHTML headers, uh, changing your table of contents into a navigation table of contents, and doing a couple of little changes in your OPF. There's really not a whole lot that you have to do to take a standard basic EPUB2 document and turn it into something that is packaged as an EPUB3. So that's just the, all the basics you have to do. There's not a whole lot more than that. If you're doing novels, that's, um, you know, that's the majority of your changes right there. You don't really have to go through a lot of extra stuff. But now, let's talk about best practices, because this, this is where the rubber really meets the road with EPUB3, and I really want you to have a better understanding of what EPUB3 is about, because there's more to this than just packaging it as an EPUB3. Um, so one, the first best practice, and something you should really be doing in every ebook you do, regardless of even whether it's EPUB2 or EPUB3, um, is doing semantic code. Now semantic, let's define what semantic is. Semantic means code that actually means something. Um, when we're talking about something that is, uh, you know, code that means something, we're thinking, okay, I have a heading, it's chapter one, uh, I'm going I'm to mark that in a heading, uh, in a heading tag. A lot of times when you're exporting content from other, other uh, formats, so for instance InDesign, you export your file as an as a, uh, EPUB document, 
if you haven't gone through and used InDesign in the right way to specify, I want this this character style, this paragraph style, to be converted into this you know this other related HTML tag. Uh, most of the time, it'll come through from uh, from InDesign just as a bunch of paragraph tags. Now your headings are not paragraphs. Your headings are headings, and they need to be marked as headings. Uh, and the same thing applies for block quotes, for images, for figures, for you know all these other elements within your document. Using semantic markup allows the reading system to recognize content properly. It allows the reading system to uh, understand what it is it's trying to display. Um, and if you're if you're using heading tags properly and block quotes properly and other semantic markup properly, then even on devices like the Nook that will strip out all of your mark all of your styling uh, and you know, turn off publisher defaults or whatever, uh, even on devices that do that kind of thing to your content, you'll still see um, very you know, you'll still see the basic outline and basic. Uh, flow of the content because you're not you're not getting rid of all the styling completely. There's still some base styling uh, that's going to be built into every document because of the semantic code. Um, so this this is a really important part of building EPUB documents. and something I really recommend you focus on when you're when you're doing your work on EPUB two or EPUB three. Using clean coding in your HTML is also important. Um, that means not having a bunch of span tags wrapping around all of your content. If you have a paragraph tag uh, that has a, a span tag nested inside of it, and maybe the paragraph tag has some styling and the span tag has some other styling, that's just bad markup. And if you export from Microsoft Word, that's a really common practice in Word's export into HTML, is to just add a bunch of span tags to do character styling and you know, say this is, I'm going to use this font and this font color and this, you know, these other things. Um, that kind of markup just it adds a lot of extra bulk to your book, so it makes your books bigger than they need to be. Uh, it makes it more difficult for reading systems, especially the slower ones, to actually know how to display the content. Because has to read that information in, recognize what it is, and display the content on the page in the way that it's supposed to for that. So it's very important to clean your code up, get all of your get all of your styling cleaned up, so that it's it's uh, your code isn't isn't all messy and have lots of extra bloat that it doesn't need to have. Uh, this also means making your HTML code machine readable. Uh, think of your HTML code as if you're talking to a computer, not necessarily you're talking to a person. Uh, if you make your, your code machine readable, then the machines that are reading it will understand it better. Also think about things from the context of structure, not style. Uh, your headings throughout your whole entire ebook should be structured. You know, if you have a part, it should be a, an H1 because the parts are a, are a heading level one within the document. Uh, chapters would then be H2s, and then sub-chapter headings would be H3, 4, 5, etc. If you don't like the way the heading looks, you can always style it in the CSS. But the whole goal of having headings 1 through 6 in the HTML specification and having that ability to put those in is that you want the structure to mean something. Uh, to the reading system. And this will come back as well when we talk about accessibility here in just a moment. Uh, this is really important for, for accessibility as well. Uh, put your styles in your CSS, not in your HTML. Don't use inline styles. Take all of the styles you have in your document, in your HTML document, and put them outside. Put them in your CSS file. Let the CSS be separate from the content itself, separate from the structure of the book, and allow, your, allow the structure itself to, to be something that means something uh, to, the, to the reading system. There are new HTML5 tags that if you're converting from an EPUB2 and EPUB3, I highly recommend you, uh, you use these tags, take advantage of them where you can. Uh, the section tag is a, is a specific marker uh, that is kind of a, I guess you could say it's a div that is specifically geared toward marking major sections of your book. So if you have chapters, prologue, a full word, uh, you know, notes or whatever, all of these sections are going to be marked in section tags. Uh, if you are working with a journal or a newspaper or something like that, then article would be the, the logical replacement for sections uh, for pieces of your book that are uh, your content that are actually articles. Um, the aside tag is used for sidebars, endnotes, um, and things like that, things that are outside of the, the normal flow of the content. They're not really absolutely necessary for the understanding of what the content of the book or the chapter is. So if you have a sidebar that's a you know that's talking about the history of something that's not really directly related to what you're doing, then the aside tag would make sense. If it was necessary, if it was a, an integral part of, of the content, uh, in the sense that if you if you were reading the book, you wouldn't want to skip it um, in in order to continue the flow of thought, 
then you would use a section tag instead if you wanted to just separate it out into its own section in some way. The HR tag, the, the, the horizontal rule tag from HTML is now defined for thematic breaks. Uh, it's not just a way of separating and having a line that separates content out. It actually is being used in, uh, for thematic breaks. So in your novels, if you're doing a section break or scene break between, between scenes in your novel, you know, usually you have a, a, some white space or a little fleur de lis of some kind. Th this is where you would have uh, an HR tag. And you can use styling in CSS to, to make an image show up in, in that location instead of a, just a line. Uh, and little asterisks or something. You, know, you can you can do some uh, some styling to make it look pretty, but the goal is again semantically you're marking this as a scene break or a, a thematic break in the content. Uh, another new HTML5 tag is the header tag. A header is what you mark all of your headings in, and and this is and this is important because you're marking the difference between the header of the content uh, of your section and the body of the content your section, almost like the way you have an HTML page broken up into header and body, uh, although in the, in the HTML, in the content, there's no body, it's just, there's just a header. So if you have a chapter uh, name, a, ch a chapter title of some kind, maybe you have a subtitle of some kind, if you have a quote at the top of the chapter that is, uh, you know, goes with the chapter itself, uh, or some sort of, you know, some sort of, you know, extra element or content there at the top of your, of your chapter, this is what you're going to include in that header tag. Uh, so all of it just goes in the header tag and it's still marked up the way you want it to be, uh, you know, class names and everything else if you want those to have, be there as well for styling purposes. Okay, let's talk about EPUB type attributes. Now this is a, a, another best practice of EPUB 3, one of those things you really should be thinking about doing when you're going into EPUB 3 from EPUB 2. Do the semantic inflection. Semantic inflection means going deeper than what your elements are. So when you mark something as a section, to a computer, it just sees a section tag and says, okay, this is a section, that's all I know. Well, if you want it to be known as a chapter, that this section is actually a chapter of the book, then you can say EPUB type equals chapter, and that specifies to the reading system, hey, this section that I'm dealing with is a chapter of the book. So if for some reason the reading system wanted to give a, uh, a list of chapters in some different way that it wouldn't you know, be pulling from your navigation table of contents or something, they could do that really easily using these EPUB types. Um, there's a standard vocabulary for these EPUB type attributes. Uh, I won't show you that whole list, but it's a, it's a really straightforward list. Uh, you can go to the IDPF website here to, uh, to take a look at it and, and, and figure out what, which uh, vocabulary you need to use for the different sections or pieces of your book. Footnotes can be problematic in this way. Um, you'll, you'll note that if you have a, uh, a note reference within your content that has an EPUB type of note ref, uh, and then again, you're pointing with a usually an href of some kind. You're pointing to a place in the document, either in the same document uh, like I have here, or possibly at the end of your book, um, if you have endnotes and another another HTML file somewhere else. Um, within the uh, within the let's say, let's say okay, so you mark this up as a note reference, and then you you have in the in the same document, maybe at the bottom of the chapter, you have all the footnotes. Well, each footnote you want to have in an, uh, an aside tag. The aside tag, again, separating out this content from the normal flow of content uh, in the book so that if, if someone's saying, you know, going into distraction-free mode, they're not going to be seeing these asides, right? They're not going to be seeing the, the notes necessarily um, because they don't need the note. They just need to know that the note is there because they can see the number, the reference number in the, in the content. They can click on it and maybe then see it. Um, the aside tag marks it as, as an aside, and then the EPUB type equals note would mark it as a note of some kind. Now, the, if you go and look at the vocabulary for EPUB 3, uh, EPUB types, there, there's actually three different, you know, EPUB type uh, vocabulary items you can choose from. You can note, rear note, or footnote, and that uh, the rear note and footnote would define this as being either an end note of some kind or a footnote at the bottom of the screen or bottom of the page kind of footnote. Um, and so you can choose which one you want, um, but, but, you know, note is a more generic one for that. Um, the problem you run into with footnotes right now is that when you mark up your EPUB 3 documents with this EPUB type markup, uh, the iBooks platform automatically uh, changes your footnotes into, uh, into pop-ups. So Andal, Apple handles these as pop-ups without any file creator control. You have no control over whether or not uh, there's, you know, there's going to be pop-ups for footnotes in your book. Uh, we found with one of the books we created recently that the that the pop-ups actually uh, had some linking issues, and I, I don't know if they fixed them or not since then. We haven't been playing with it recently, but um, if you 
click on a link inside of one of those footnote pop-ups to go to a different place in, in a different part of the book, a different chapter of the book. It just wouldn't work properly. Uh, so there's some things like that, and, and this is, I think, a harbinger of things to come. Uh, as Because the EPUB specification doesn't say, hey, footnotes should be marked up in this way, and that will result in footnotes being in a pop-up. All it says is footnotes should be marked up this way which means that every reading system can handle footnotes in its own way and do whatever it wants to with them, essentially. Uh, so that there's possibility of some problems as we, as we see EPUB 3 adoption. Um, different reading systems will probably handle these EPUB type attributes in different ways and give different functionality for their readers because they, you know, the, the reading system manufacturers want those things to work uh, in the ways that they think they should. So be careful about that. Make sure you, again, test everything. Make sure you know what your book is going to look like. Uh, when someone downloads it and takes a look at it. Accessibility is the last element of best practices that I want to talk about today. And, and basically, accessibility includes all of the above best practices. You want to do semantic code. You want to use the new HTML5 tags like section and header and article and aside. Uh, you want to make sure you're using EPUB type attributes and using those properly. Uh, do all of that and make sure that that's done first because that's that's uh, core functionality of EPUB 3, core functionality of HTML5, and really does affect uh, in a lot of ways the accessibility of your content. Um, and then also you want to add summaries and descriptions on all of your tables and figures and images. Uh, you want to make sure that those things are, are taken care of properly and you have, you have the right information that would be displayed to someone who is reading the book uh, who has uh, visual impairments or something and they can't see the, the picture but they need a, a description of some kind. Uh, you want alt text for images but there's a difference between alt text and summaries or descriptions. Uh, so uh, learn the differences between those two different things but make sure you include them uh, for all of your images. Um, you want to see EPUB 3 best practices for more information on this. Um, I'll have a link to it on the next on the next slide. But EPUB 3 best practices is a, a book that's uh, the, published by O'Reilly Publishers. Um, I highly recommend you read it. I highly recommend you study it. It has really good information on all of the things we talked about in today's webinar. Um, the uh, if you don't understand the spec the spec itself, the EPUB 3 specification from IDPF or if it's hard for you to really kind of figure out practicalities, uh, the, the EPUB 3 Best Practices uh, book is a really good, really good place to go for those practicalities. Uh, the BISG, BSG EPUB 3 Support Grid is also an important resource, uh, and so these th three links are things that you're going to need to know as you're going from EPUB 2 into EPUB 3. Uh, 